Hello, yes, that's right. It's Joe here, live for Joyrider TV. That is, of course, if you're watching this live. If you're not watching this live, then yes, it is Joe here for Joyrider TV, but perhaps not live. You might be watching this later on. Yes, um, what we're here to do is to look at answering your catamaran sailing questions, um, which is nice. So if you are watching this live, then of course, uh, please uh, stick them in the live chat. If you happen to be watching this uh, later on and not live, then by all means, if you do have any catamaran sailing questions, then just put them in the comments below and then I will respond to your catamaran sailing questions in next week's Q&A. Um, I'm coming to you from the Wild Wind Workshop, which uh, for the last week has been pretty much dormant because we're closed now here at Wild Wind for the season. Um, so uh, there's no boats on the beach uh, to repair or do things with. So uh, that's why it's been a little bit slow coming with any other videos at the moment. Uh, just saying hello to everybody who's tuning in live. Hello to Laura in Santa Cruz. Great to have you on board. Hello, Rich. Rich is, of course, from the uh, International Hobie Class Association. Great to have you on board, Rich. Um, Fred's with us. Howdy. Great to have you, Fred. Uh, RJ Fleet from Lake Benton, Minnesota. Listening and learning. Let's hope we've got some good questions uh, coming in today. Of course, as usual, I have got some preloaded questions, uh, which people might have asked in the comments from last week's video or just in other videos on Joyrider TV. So don't feel that you have to blast away with all of your questions that you already know the answers to, um, unless you want to see what my answer is to those questions. Uh, we've got Leland Lee. Uh, greetings from Florida, uh, boating blacksmiths on board. Uh, also in Florida, popular place. Uh, this uh, It'll be this morning in Florida uh, to be tuning in. All right. Fred says, it's been a short while since I last sailed the Hobie 16. It's remained rigged and essentially a rack. Oh, Oh, on a, essentially a rack over the water so it stayed dry. What should I check before hopping on for a winter sail in Florida, by the way? Oh, so Fred's in Florida as well. Wow, we're Florida heavy today, guys. All right. So, um, yeah, if I, before going out on a boat, I don't even, maybe, I've, no, I haven't. Um, yes, I have. What we, um, this is, <laughs> the Wild Wind Workshop, here we go. We have actually got, bear with me a sec, um, some checklists of everything that um, we look at on a daily basis here. But that's because the boats are getting used a lot. But you should certainly be doing these checks as well. This makes answering this question quite answer, quite easy. So I've got general catamarans, monohulls, uh, not relevant here, and then Tiger FX1 Pacific Tornado checklist. So with the 16 checklist, here we go. Let's run down it. So the first thing you want to check is we'll start at the back of the boat. So we're just going to start with the rudder system, and we're going to check that the rudder system has got the right number of split rings holding the rudders on. So you want to make sure there is a split ring in the top and the bottom of each rudder pin. Um, next, we continue uh, to checking the rudder cams. If you lift your tiller connecting bar and you see that your rudder cam is in this position, you want to flip that back upright um, because this is not going to allow the rudder to lock down it's in that position. The easiest way to put the, uh, the rudder cam upright when you're on land is take quite a large screwdriver like this and we just put it into the gap here at the bottom and a bit like Harry Potter we're going to twist and flick 
Oh, wow, this is a tight one, but twist and sort of twist and lever, let's say, to get the cam into the right position like this, just to make sure that your rudders will lock down. All right, what's next on the list? Any movement in the stock? Um, if it's not so windy, I wouldn't worry too much about that. But um, certainly uh, lift the rudder blade up and just move it from side to side. If there is a lot of movement between the rudder blade and the inside of the stock, then you could just tighten this nut up, um, which holds the rudder blade in, just so there's a little bit of resistance there. Um, and then the last one on the rudders is the joint with the tiller extension where the tiller extension bolts through the tiller connecting bar. Um, there's a nut and bolt, essentially. And if there's a load of movement there, just tighten that nut up a bit. And that's your rudders. Good to go. Next thing is check the trampoline. Um, just check the trampoline lacing is still tied up nicely um, and it's not going to come undone as soon as you sit on it. If you've got time, it depends if you're just jumping onto the boat and going for a quick sail or if you're going to be going for a sail several times over the weekend. If it's the latter, then maybe it's worth tightening your trampoline up if it's possible in the situation where you've got the boat. Um, and then onto the rigging. All right, let's just see if I've got something here. Yes, I have. Opa. All right, because you're not going to be able to drop the mast this in your current situation. So we have we have to do what we can. So what we want to do with the rigging is um, this is the standard setup for the shroud chain plate. This is what attaches onto the wires that hold the mast up. So mast, hulls, and then you've got these wires, which we call the shrouds, and the one that goes forward, and we call that the forestay, just in case anybody out there isn't uh, too hot on the terms. So this would be at the bottom of the shroud, attaching the shroud to the hull. Um, so what we want to make sure is that all of these rings are in good shape. And then I'm running off again. Uh, and then what I would generally do is take some electrical tape like this. And just to absolutely make sure that these can't come out. We'd start off on the ring and then stretching it on so that the whole ring is covered and then we can just snap that off and we can do that with all of the rings, the pins and rings there. That is really great for peace of mind, but also it is going to help to stop anything from jumping out um, or maybe you just catch something gets caught on it, like a rope or something gets caught on the ring, could pull the, uh, could pull that split ring out. Um, there's also split rings on the forestay where it meets the, the bridle wires. Well worth checking. Let's see what else is on the list. Uh, the trapeze adjusters and shock cord. Just make sure everything is looking good there. Um, the shroud anchor bars. Hmm. Yes, yeah, so where these parts attach to the hull, these go on to what's called the shroud anchor pin, and that screws into a plate, and these can become looser over time. So the thing to do is you can just grab this and just give it a good twist and just tighten it up until you can't twist it anymore, and then that is pretty safe. What else have we got here? If there's any shackles on the boat, which you can get at, just make sure they're all tight. Um, and then 
I would, um, it's not going to be the end of the world if you don't, but I would replace, if you need to, any wind indicators on the boat as well. If, they're, if they've come off, like if you've had wind indicators like we have using tape, uh, cassette tape tied onto the bridle wires, you might need to replace those. So plenty of things to look at there. And then when you unroll your sails, this isn't on the list, actually. Oh, yes, it is. Um, yeah, just check that all the battens are tied in uh, because you don't want to be losing battens there. Um, that could absolutely ruin your weekend or whatever period you've got to go sailing. Um, yeah. And then uh, where the main sail attaches to the boom, uh, make sure that's all good. And then I would also just give the main sheet a wash as well in fresh water. And then I would think you're pretty ready to go. Obviously, it, if you've left your boat for a long time, it is beneficial to either put the boat on its side or drop the mast and check the rigging at the top of the mast, um, where I would just uh, have a visual inspection of the rigging, but then take um, uh, some pliers or I like to use an adjustable spanner and just give all the shackles up there a little tweak to make sure that you're not going to have any mast falling down style surprises. So that would be ideal. But of course, it's not always possible. And then just check your bungs are still there. If your boat's been there a long time, you never know what might have happened to your bungs. Well worth having a spare pair of bungs in your toolbox or in your car, because if you turn up at your boat and the bungs aren't there, you can't go sailing. So bungs, very cheap, well worth having a spare set, which you uh, just take with you. So I hope that helps. Um, great question, by the way. Thank you very much. All right. Yeah. Uh, Boating Blacksmith says in Florida, not much winter here at this, this time. Yeah, it's been pretty good here in Greece as well. Uh, looks like our sunny second summer, uh, which we've been enjoying here in Greece, is coming to an end uh, this evening, perhaps tomorrow morning, with quite a decent amount of rain. Uh, so we'll see how that looks. All right. We've got Christopher on board. Who says tuning it, tuning from the Outer Banks, North Carolina. Nice. Just picked up a used Hobie 14. What's the most important thing for me to practice before I get out on the water? Um, if you're not so familiar with catamaran sailing generally, um, what I would do is just review the videos which um, tell, tell you where and how to sit on the boat. Um, all this kind of like sail settings um upwind and downwind which angles you should be sailing and then just go through the procedure for tacking it's well worth going through that procedure that tacking procedure on land just so that you really get it dialed in to your head um that procedure we have been through it many times but um just to break it down into uh We'll see how many points we break it down into. So the first one is um, make sure you're sailing as close to the wind as possible. Then once you're as close to the wind as possible, let's take it for let's take it as it's obvious that you're going to check the area that you're going to tack into. Once you've done that, we want to get the main sheet in tight and then once we've done that we can initiate the turn and then once we're head to wind we'll sheet out and cross the boat and yeah so that's one two three four sort of five points there to remember when you're tacking. But if you go through it a few times on land before you go sailing, then that is going to make it a bit more fluent for you once you're out on the water. Um, 
also you could if you've got um if the boat is in like a grassy boat park um or you've got plenty of space and you can tip the boat over on land then if there's if you get to the boat and there's not much wind or if you've just got the boat there anyway um what i used to do back in the early days i used to tip my boat over a lot and just practice um writing cap sizes on land which is quite a valuable um thing to do but just if you are going to tip your boat over on land just make sure that there's nothing sharp or pointy that is going to go into the hull and make sure your rudders are straight and if you drop the rudder down onto the floor before tipping the boat over that means as your boat goes onto its side the rudder blade isn't going to dig into the ground uh top tip there yeah so those i'd say that's what i would do there all right we got helmuth albert from fr let's just say from france great to have you on board there uh thanks for tuning in mike's on board who says i cut my foot on that thing that is another reason to tape it i believe he's talking about this thing yeah anything you could cut yourself on as well um especially anything well just anything generally but anything around here where this join is if you capsize in a pitch polling kind of manner and you end up in that sort of arena you don't want anything sharp you can catch your, your hand on you're going to be wanting just to grab hold of the boat wherever so if you just check everything that could potentially be sharp like um at the bottom of the trapeze wires as well this is quite a common place for one strand of the wire just to come away, leaving quite a sharp, exposed, pokey bit of wire. So uh, just check things like that. And if you have got on the trapeze wire, if you've got one exposed, pokey bit of wire, um, yes, you will need to replace it. But yes, you can still go sailing and it's you're going to be unlucky if it breaks the first time out after noticing it. So just get some tape on there so that it's not going to jab you in the hand. Good point there, Mike. All right. Leland Lee says any specific salt water safe lubricants to use on the rudders and jib tracks. Yeah, I, I don't. Um, you're not going to believe this, but I don't generally use many lubricants at all on the boat um i'll use a bit of grease here and there um just get some waterproof grease to put in the rudder system like down here if you if you're sailing a hobie um where all of this mechanism in is get that greased up and then um personally i would do it once a month but perhaps for you uh once a season take the whole lot apart clean it all and then re-grease it that keeps this whole system working really nicely but i don't generally put any lubricant um on the tracks but what i would use if i was going to would be something silicon based definitely not wd-40 because wd-40 attracts things to stick to it so like if you sail in a place where there is sand if you use wd-40 on anything it will soon become a grinding paste rather than a nicely lubricated whatever which means you're gradually going to be grinding away at whatever part of the boat you have put that on that is what i would say all right we've got chris on board uh he's just hopped off his towboat on the mississippi river nice what I've realised is America is a big place. I'm going to go there one day on the world tour and visit you all and uh, see what's going on. All right. Boat in Blacksmith in Florida says I'm going to be sailing off a beach with surf soon. How do you go out and come back in with an onshore wind and surf? 
think this is a common issue, a uh, common situation for many people as this question comes up quite a lot. So if this is our beach, I think Green may have left us. All right. Green's off. All right. So um, the beach today is in red. There we go. And then we've got some surf coming in. Um, what we want to try to avoid in the first place is if the surf is of such a size that there's actually people riding the waves, then this or size or shape um, where there's people riding the waves, this would generally uh, should put up some sort of warning sign that perhaps this isn't the best place to be heading out. What you want to do is look for a place where the waves aren't breaking as frequently and sail from there. Um, I think we went over this a little bit last week, but the reason the waves break is because what happens is this rolling swell, uh, which is out at sea, once it gets into the depth of water, which is equal to the height of the wave, so if that's so if the the seabed which today is in red as we've uh, said is right down here then that wave isn't going to break but if that seabed was here then it is going to break so the two different types of waves uh, of way the waves will break is sort of run over run out of space over here let's uh just go up here is is if we've got a seabed like this that suddenly goes up this is where the break the waves are going to break what we call very heavy um, when we say a wave is breaking heavy, if it's a heavy wave, or if we say the wave is breaking top to bottom, that's because it is suddenly going from deep water into shallow water. And what that does is means that this part of the wave comes straight down. Um, so uh, this is, if you've seen people surfing, this would be the sort of wave where people might be getting barreled or tubed. Uh, you know, you might have someone in there riding the wave. Very nice. Having a lovely time. But for you sailing out on your catamaran, not a good choice unless you're doing a remake of, say, of sharing the wind. Whereas if the seabed, this is what we want. If it gradually shelves like this, then what will happen is the way that the waves will break. So it'll probably be this one is they'll just crumble at the top. Like that. Um, and it won't break top to bottom. It will just crumble. So there'll be a bit of white water involved, but it won't be heavy like this bad boy. You should be able to see from standing on the beach where the waves are breaking really heavily and where they're just crumbling. And what you want to do is be sailing out through the crumbly waves, not the heavy ones. That is the big piece of advice. And then when you're actually ready to go, what you want to do is get the boat out far enough that you could get the rudders down if it's possible. Um, or if the if this is all just white water, if all of these waves are just white water and it's not so windy, you should be able to get out with your rudders halfway down. But if you can, if it is looking like you have got some pretty juicy stuff to encounter, then um, get a bit further out, get the rudders locked down, get on the boat and just get sailing as soon as you can in the direction 
of the waves which aren't breaking quite as steeply. And then if as you're sailing out, if the wave hit directly in front of you looks like it's just about to go, like even on a crumbly one, that point where it's just about to go, that's where it's at its steepest. And it could, even a wave like this, if it's big enough, could capsize you, which could potentially, um, you know, you could damage your mast um, if it goes into the bottom. So we don't want to do that. And generally, you won't have the whole wave, all of this, breaking at the same time because the seabed, it's unlikely it will be completely uniform all the way along the coast. So what we can do, if we think, oi, oi, that's looking pretty steep just there, we can bear off and look for the bit that has either broken already. So once the wave's broken already, uh, a lot of the energy has come out of it, or if it looks like the wave isn't going to break, and then just head up when you see the bit that looks favourable. There we go. I haven't done so much sailing in the surf, but I've done a lot of surfing in the surf, windsurfing in the surf, kite surfing in the surf. So I know how the waves work and how I would go about it if I was out there in a catamaran. There we go. All right. So just scrolling back. Uh, welcome on board, everyone who's tuning in. Great to have you with us. Um, Lee says, if I don't sheet out when tacking, am I in danger of capsizing? No, you're not in danger of capsizing. But what you are in danger of. Oh, well, perhaps you are in danger of capsizing, actually. But the big point of sheeting out during tacking is to allow the boat to turn away from the wind on the new side. What the main sheet does when the rudders aren't working, so the rudders only work when the boat is going forwards. Yes. Mm. Yes. Mm. 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 Yes. Mm. Yes. Only when you're going forwards. Um, so if you're not going forwards, which is quite normal if you're head to wind, um, or for just that, that point the rudders aren't working very well because your forward speed is minimal when you're not moving forwards what the mainsail does is it brings you head to wind because it's push putting pressure behind the pivot point um i'm not going to draw it this time we've been through this many many times but it's putting pressure behind the pivot point which is going to push the boat up head to wind which is why when we are head to wind to get away from the wind and start sailing on the new side, it is essential to release the main sheet. Now, the amount of main sheet that you release just depends on how confident you are, how experienced you are in tacking your boat. The more tacks you've done, the less you can release the main sheet and still have a good tack. But to start with, if you're new to cat sailing, definitely just dump a load of main sheet when you head to wind and you'll have a much higher rate of success when tacking. There we go. Hey, we've got Cole on board. Hello, Cole. Uh, great to have you with us. All right. Uh, going back to the lubricant. Um, Cole has been using McLube sail coat for everything on my dinghy. Works like a charm. Really, any dry lubricant should do decently. Yeah. Because the dry lubricant is less likely to attract stuff like sand or grit or dirt. Um, but that McLube, I've heard, I think that's made by Harkin, if I'm uh, not mistaken. Reasonably expensive, which means don't use very much, which is actually a win-win. Harkin are winning because it's expensive. You're winning because it's expensive, so you don't want to use too much. You, not using too much is definitely the way to go with any sort of lubricant. All right, here we go. Uh, Fred says, if I used lubricant, it's WD-40 specialist lubricant. So I'm guessing that that is not the normal WD-40. All right, um, back to if you turn up and your bungs are missing, Chris says, gorilla tape, 
conceal a stern plug in a pinch. There we go. I've never had to try, fortunately. Um, all right, we've got Jamie Bravo on board. Thanks for tuning in, Jamie. He says, winter here in Oregon. Last year, I sailed using a 5-4 wetsuit and rain gear and was still cold. Do you know of any comfortable semi-dry suit brand you recommend for sailing? Um, there's, yeah, rather than semi-dry suits, I think you're better off if it's cold, just go for a dry suit. It's what that um, if you go to Germany, nothing, um, not saying anything about German people, except for German people to extend their season. I'd say 90 percent of German sailors own a dry suit, not a semi dry suit, but a dry, dry suit. There are many, many brands that you can go for any of the big brands. I would guess to buy a dry suit. I haven't even looked at the price of a dry suit for about 20 years, but I would guess a dry suit would be about 400 US dollars. And then you could put um, like a fleecy suit underneath and then you'll be perhaps not quite as warm as toast, but um, perhaps uh, a bit warmer than you would have been otherwise. There we go. All right. Lot in the live chat today. Thanks for tuning in, everybody. I was worried I was going to be in here on my own, as you can see uh, in the background. Where is that? There, it is dark. So very spooky uh, this week, especially. All right. Um, oh, so uh, just on that topic of what to wear, Chris says, try Zyke's super warm series wetsuits. I have one of their fleece lined Farmer John style suits that will cook me in water temperatures down to the low 50s. Now, look, the Zyke stuff, spelt Z-I-Z-H-I-K, um, is probably some of the best sailing gear that you can get. But then when you look at it, you'll know why it's the best because of the price tag. Um, what came first? the quality or the price tag, the two go together, I think, generally. Um, OK, so we've got Jacob on board, who says, hey, guys, do you have any tips for sailing in big waves on an F-18? Well, it's pretty much the same for any type of boat. The difference with the F-18 is if you're sailing with the spinnaker up, and then if you are sailing with the spinnaker up, um, it's kind of like the distance between the waves which becomes the big factor rather than the size of the waves because if you've got a good distance between the waves when you're going downwind then what you want to do is not take let's um let's draw the wave like that so this is the wave here. So if you take on the downwind leg, if you take a route straight down the wave, it's going to be over very quickly and you're not going to benefit very much from going downhill. And also, um, if there isn't such a distance in between the waves, you're more likely to stick the nose into the wave in front. Um, so if it's possible, like with the wind direction, wind strength, uh, when you've got your kite up, if it is possible to take a bit more of a diagonal route down the wave, you'll get, you'll be on that wave for much longer, thus benefiting from this going downhill kind of um, vibe. And uh, that is really going to help. And then when it comes to jibing in waves, we're just jumping straight into jibing on waves. Um, you want to be jibing when you're going downhill because that's the same as jibing just after a gust when the boat is going at its fastest and you're effectively going to be have as little pressure in the rig as possible. So if you can pop it through the jibe there, then you're going to have a very nice jibe indeed. It's going to feel absolutely fantastic. So 
that would be the point to jibe. And then if we're going the other way, on the upwind, you're quite likely to be coming up the wave at an angle because generally the, the waves will be moving in the same direction as the wind. Um, not all the time, but this would be, I'd say, seven times out of ten. So you'll be sailing upwind into the waves. So this line here, if this is the top of the wave, then we're talking rolling swell here. When you get to the top, what you don't want to do, although it looks absolutely great in photographs, is to launch the boat out of the top. Uh, if you can get the dagger boards out of the water, then that is uh, Instagram solid gold right there. If you get the photo, of course. But if you're trying, if you're racing and you're wanting to sail fast, then getting the boat out of the water isn't fast because when it comes down, you kind of it really jars everything. Your flow of water around the hulls, it's all going to be disturbed. Your airflow around the sails disturbed. Uh, your crew is going to be upset, stuff like that. So to avoid that happening, what you want to do is either be flying the hull slightly. If you're flying the hull, what that does is it really loads up the leeward hull. So as you get to the top of the wave, that load keeps the boat attached to the wave. But um, what you can also do if this is our route, is when you get to the top, just bear away slightly. And what that will do is put more load on this leeward bow, which will just keep that attached to the water and stop you from taking off. If you do want to take off, of course, what you want to do is have the boat dead flat as you get to the top of the wave. So if you have been flying a hull, just as you get to the top, head up slightly, that will give you a more vertical takeoff and just hold on to your hats. And then once you've left the wave, get forwards as quickly as you can to flatten the boat out. Boom. You might break something, though. It's quite a lot. heavy, heavy landings. All right, I hope that helps there, uh, Jacob. All right, we've got Mr. Tony KP on board. Sorry I'm late today. Good day to everyone. Hello, Mr. Tony KP. Great to have you on board all right so uh albert in france says concerning position if single-handed a friend of mine told me it's important to be as far as possible in the front of the catamaran i never heard that before yeah um in fact we I think the same person told somebody last week because we went through this last week in quite a lot of detail about positioning on the boat. And what we're looking for with forwards and backwards positioning on the boat, generally speaking, is to have the boat. This is our hull. We want to have it totally level. So we don't want the bows down. We don't want the stern down. Apologies if you had watched last week where we went through the same thing again. But um, this is important. It's what we call trim. Trim. Forwards and backwards movements on the boat. Um, now, the difference between sailing single-handed and with a crew is, let's do this in red, is if we're... When we're sailing with two people, the two people are going to be quite, they want to be as close together as possible at all times in a forwards and backwards um, plane. So you want to be really close together. Even if you're on opposite sides of the boat, uh, the two people want to be the same distance up the boat as possible. Which means if you're single handed, to keep the trim, this forwards and backwards level, the same if you're single-handed, you're going to want to be halfway between where you would have been if you were two people. So halfway between where those two people would have been. 
So what this means is, yes, your friend who says um, uh, you need to be further forwards is correct, but not much further forwards. We're only talking like about that much further forwards, not massively further forwards. Of course, it does depend on which type of boat you're sailing. Different types of boat like to be sailed in different ways. All right. And continuing. Meanwhile, I tested it and it's true. Moving forwards before the phase passing the wind. Uh, moving back on the new side helps a lot. It was medium wind. Right. OK. Um, yeah. And then not sure how moving forwards on strong wind would higher the risk of the capsize. Yes. Yeah, so when we're talking about strong wind and our position on the boat, um, it's the same effectively. So we're just trying to keep the boat level like, th like this. If you feel that the, the bows are riding high, so on this type of hull shape, which would be a bit like a Dart 18, the water wants to be about a third of the way up this curve here, maybe even a little bit lower. If you can see the hole down here, because it's not in the water, then that means you're not far enough forwards. So we're not looking at, um, all right, we're sailing upwind. We will be in this position. Uh, like that is where we go when we sail upwind. No, instead, what we do is we're going to look at the hull on the leeward side of the boat and think, is the boat really level? Are we showing too much bow? And then if we are showing too much bow, then move forwards. So if you do it that way round, then you're not going to be any more in any more risk of sticking the nose in capsizing. You're just going to be sailing the boat as efficiently as possible. The one thing that is more of a risk when you're single handed um, is when you're tacking. If you spend too much time at the back of the boat. Which it is necessary to go to the back of the boat uh, when you're crossing the boat to pass the tiller extension, the joystick, the stick um, from one hand to the other. It is necessary to go there. So but what you want to do if you're single handed, especially is not spend too much time at the back of the boat, because if you do, especially if it's on a boat which has low volume at the back of the hull, like if we were sailing a boat with a hull shape like this, like a Hobie 14, for example, um, we just want to lit. we want to start off here, then go to the back to pass the stick, then get forwards again on the other side as soon as we can, basically to stop the wind from getting underneath the trampoline and flipping us over. So uh, thanks very much for your questions there, Albert. That's very, um, very nice. Although we did have the questions before, do check out last week's Q&A video as well. And in fact, in any of the Q&A videos, if you look at the uh, description of the video, it will have times of which questions we talked about. So you can just check what time the relevant question to you was talked about. So you don't have to go through the whole thing just to get to that bit. So um, that's quite handy, I think. All right. At this point in the game, 44 minutes, we're going to just take a short commercial break. I'm hoping that Toots on board, say uh, elevator music. Um, Yes, um, at this stage in the game, um, I'd just like to um, put out some thanks to everybody who has been supporting Joyrider TV. Um, without your support, especially those who have been supporting Joyrider TV on Patreon, uh, without your support, there's a strong chance I would have hung up my video camera by now because there's a lot of work that goes into it all and not much in return apart from that warm feeling inside that I'm helping a lot of people to get more out of their boats. But because so many of you have been chipping in on Patreon, it has given me that warm feeling inside 
and uh, being able to buy food for the family in the cold winter months. So thanks very much to everybody for supporting the channel. All right, Declan's on board in Stockholm, Sweden. He says, uh, happy Friday. Great to have you with us. Ryan is here in Maui. Um, he's made it. Maui, Hawaii. Um, I dare say um, Ryan must be almost as much in the past as you can go uh, before we cross the, the date line into another day, into tomorrow. Wow, weird. Um, yeah. Anyway. All right. Declan says I put my getaway into its winter house last Sunday. It's a sad time when you put your boat away for the winter. But it's also a happy time because you know that then when you get it out, you'll have the whole season in front of you, which I know in Sweden isn't as long as it is here in the south. All right. Boating Blacksmith with a question. This is the hot topic. He says, how do you depower going downwind um, or on a broad reach? Well, firstly, the broad reach and going downwind is effectively the same thing. Because when we're sailing downwind, we don't sail straight downwind, of course. We, I uh, don't know what this sail is. Um, we sail with the apparent wind, the combination of the true wind and the induced wind. The induced wind is what we create by moving forwards. Um, and the combination of those two winds makes our apparent wind, which hits the boat at 90 degrees. Um, so this is the first and most important concept to think about when going downwind is that this is the angle that we want the wind um, displaying on our telltales on the boat. Um, so we need some way of seeing that. So what's very important, the most useful and cheapest upgrade you can do to your boat is on the bridle wires, um, put some uh, tape, either cassette tape or video tape, if you can find some, or you could get some streamers made out of like spinnaker cloth or something. But we use video tape because it's effectively free. Um, and so it costs nothing. And then we're just looking for these streamers made out of videotape. Is that small enough so you can't see it? Um, to be going directly across the boat. So that is the angle. So if you start off on that angle, you are going to be better off than any other angle. So the way to depower the boat, first thing is what is going to be the biggest issue on a windy downwind point of sail, the biggest issue is going to be sticking this bow in. Um, or both. That one mostly, this one as well, a bit. So if you get a really big gust, boom, bows go in and the back of the boat overtakes the front of the boat and you're upside down. So that is what we're trying to avoid. So what we want to do is we want to counterbalance that by getting as far to the back of the boat as possible. That's us right at the back. And then uh, what we'll do is we'll set the traveller about two thirds of the way out and then we'll have the main sheet eased and the jib the same or the jib all the way out. Um, main sheet eased with the wind at that direction. And then that is our starting point. So main sheet loose. When we're turning onto this broad reach, what we want to do is as we turn the corner, we want to loosen the traveler and the main sheet before we start turning. Um, because uh, that means that as we turn, we're not going to get overpowered. We've already depowered enough as we turn the corner. There we go. Um, yeah. And then if we get a gust, so when we get a gust, that's when things are going to happen. So as we get the gust, we just want to ease a bit of main sheet. 
if it's just a normal size gust and the rudders don't come out, ease an armful of main sheet, and then at the same time, just turn a little bit more downwind because the boat will have been going faster, which makes the induced wind more. Um, so turn more downwind in the gust and ease a bit of main sheet as you do it. When it's windy, whenever you turn downwind, ease the main sheet out because that takes the pressure off that leeward bow. And then if your boat slows down and the tapes start blowing forwards like that, then turn back to get those tapes on 90 degrees. So that is how we deal with the power on the downwind. So once we've bore away in the gust, easing the sheet, if it feels like the boat is stable, we can bring the sheet back in. But the main way that we're depowering the boat is by sailing as fast and efficiently as possible. The faster we sail downwind, the more it takes the pressure out of the rig, which is trying to capsize us. So if we sail slower in a high wind, then we're going to have more pressure coming from behind us, trying to stick the bows in. So by sailing faster in um, on the downwind, we're going to have less pressure from the true wind trying to dig the bows in. There we go. Good question there, Boat and Blacksmith, if that helps. All right. Thanks very much to Laura for the donation there. Um, very nice. Laura is using a feature called Super Stickers, which you can find at the bottom of the live chat. Uh, thanks very much for that, Laura. Very kind. All right. There's a lot in the chat. And um, in fact, we've been going 50 minutes now. If we could say no further questions, please. Um, any further questions have to be accompanied by a super sticker. Let's say that. Uh, good, good thinking there. All right. So Declan is in. He says, I noticed that the top of the forestay on a with a furler, the cable had burst open following a pitch pole event. Need to replace that bad boy for next season. Still thinking of Dyneema rigging. Yeah, I think um, go with the Dyneema rigging. In fact, um, yeah, I thought Chris would come in on this. Chris um, in Texas is um, a user of Dyneema rigging and he knows where to get really good stuff made. Um, go visit Coligo Marine for Dyneema. Standard Dyneema won't work as a furling halyard. However, the Coligo torsion rope will. Very nice. Um, Perhaps, Chris, if you can put the website address for Coligo Marine in the comments rather than the live chat. So then anybody watching this later on can see that link and then they can go and check them out. They could say Chris sent me and uh, get some sweet Dyneema rigging. All right. We've got Frank on board in Clearwater, Florida. Everybody is in Florida today. Apart from Toot, who's in Texas, of course. All right. And just continuing down the live chat. Bit of everybody. Everybody's uh, having a chat. Nice to have you all on board, by the way. Um, Boating Blacksmith. Blacksmith says, does anybody know of a beach in Melbourne, Florida area that you can get a Hobie 16 in other than Daytona? Again, if you're watching this later on or if you're watching this now, put it in the comments as well as the live chat. If you happen to be here at the moment, that way everybody who's watching later can benefit from your experience. All right. Ryan in Maui says, interested in small radio or locator beacon suggestions that I can wear. We sail with a radio, but keep it in a tramp bag. But last crash, the boat was moving fast away from us to get to. 
but I'd like to be more prepared. I believe that is another one for Chris in Texas, who definitely knows about these things because uh, Chris is a professional of the sea and knows about locator beacons and such. Much more than I do. I only know what I've been told by um, you guys. So um, I think you guys know uh, better. Um, Frank says in uh, response to the Florida question, Daytona Beach is a favourite of mine on the East Coast. Nice. You guys should hang out. All right. Scott is on board dropping it in the slot. Uh, Scott, who is, of course, uh, had the highest speed of the season here at Wild Wind Sailing Holidays. Nice to have you with us, Scott. I can still hear you whooping in my ears from that sail. Um, oh, Toot says, hit the like button. Thank you very much, Toot. Um, is that true for a Mexican wave too, Joe? Oh, now I don't know what we are referring to now. Um, all right. So um, here we go. Chris has already answered on the uh, radio beacon uh, question. He says, always good to have a radio on one's person. I prefer the standard Horizon HX series. Excellent performance for the price. I run an 870 and an 890. You don't need the DSC function, but it's nice. There we go. All right. It's great that all you guys are friends, even though you're in different parts of the world. It's nice. All right. We've got Amory Amblard, um, who says, when sailing alone in strong winds and big waves, the cat, which is a NACRA 5 point, um, must be 5.0, often stays stuck upwind during the tack. Is it possible? to force tack whilst stuck without having to restart gaining speed etc yes this is a great question thanks very much um if you do uh just to repeat please no further questions unless they come accompanied by a super sticker uh just hit the super sticker button um so if um whichever situation you're in if it's windy and your tack fails and you end up sitting kind of head to wind, um, the first thing to recognise is that if you can recognise when the tack fails at the time, um, what happens when the tack fails is you start getting blown backwards, which means your rudders will start working the other way round. So, if we've been tacking this way, so we've had the rudders across like this, then if we get to head to wind and we start getting blown backwards, what we want to do, as with all tacking, main sheet completely loose, and then we can put the rudders across the other way. And because we're going backwards and you've got the rudders across there should be quite a lot of pressure on the rudders which means you don't even have to hold them there they will hold themselves which means when the boat start um all you need to do is notice when the boat starts moving forwards again and as soon as that happens straighten up the rudders and uh off you go but if you failed your tack and you're a little you're not head to wind, so you're not going backwards. Then rather than having to restart the boat um, and get going before you tack, what you can do is to get to this same point where we were before to get head to wind so that then we can sail backwards is just crank the main sheet in really tight. As you crank the main sheet in, what will happen is the boat will naturally turn head to wind. But because you haven't got any boat speed at all, it's reasonably unlikely you'll get through the wind. So as soon as the boat is head to wind, like here, at that point, 
again, release the main sheet, rudders the other way to go backwards, and then we're where we were before. I hope that helps. Try that out. Um, just, um, yeah, just notice when it is that you're going backwards. That is very important. Okay, so... Thanks very much to Laura for the second super sticker. And thanks very much to Ryan in um, in Maui for a super sticker as well. Uh, very nice of you. Chris says, what a shameless plug for super stickers. Yeah, but um, like Laura says, hopefully that's dinner for the family right on. Thanks very much, Laura. Um, yeah, all right. So scrolling back. All right, we've got Mark and Janet in Ohio. Great to have you on board. And Toot was there with the elevator music. Thanks for that, Toot. Always there. All right, Frank says Lefkus needs to tighten up on the internet connection. Or is it me? I think today, actually, Frank, it might just be you because nobody else has mentioned everything. And usually I get something on screen saying weak connection, but not today. It seems to be all right. All right, we've got Thomas in Germany. Uh, great to have you on board, Thomas. Um, coming from the Wild Wind Workshop. Nice to have you on board. Um, all right, so I'm just sort of scanning through the live chat now because a lot of you are sort of talking between yourselves. All right, Pedro's on board. He says, hello, nice to have you with us. All right, Ryan's, oh no, um, still chatting between yourselves. All right, still chatting between yourselves. There's some chatting between yourselves. There is no comment section apart from the live chat. Oh, okay, I didn't know that. I thought that the comment section is there. I guess what, what will happen is once the video's finished, then it will be available as a normal video. And then the comment section will present itself. All right. Um, so Chris says um, he's going to contact me and we'll send the info for the Dyneema rigging. So in fact, um, maybe we'll put a little video sort of together of uh, Coligo Marine in Texas. So I think it's in Texas. Um, so that everybody will know. And then if anybody asks, we'll say, check out the video. All right, Scott says, uh, Joe had the high speed of the season. I was just whooping along for the ride. All right, Amory, thank you very much for the donation and the super sticker. Great uh, to have your support there. Uh, that is dinner and a drink. All right. Thanks very much. Very kind. All right. Albert says, hello. I have a catamaran Ventilo 18 HT full carbon. Do you know something about this cat? Um, no, I think to cut a long story short. No, I don't know much about the Ventilo uh, brand of catamarans. Pretty sure. Is it a French brand? Um, they they built the first type of Formula 18 catamarans, which were actually before the Formula 18 rules were as they are now, where the boats were just single sail uh, very wide. But um, no, unfortunately, I don't know much about that. Sounds like an absolute beast if it is full carbon. All right. So uh, Chris says got a regatta coming up in Texas in March. The Ides of March will be March the 25th, 26th at Lake Somerville, Texas. Oh, uh, Coligo Marine is in California. And Declan says, any update on Joyriders Week at Wildwind next June? No, nothing as of yet. But um, yeah, I don't know how we're going to organise that, but let's do something for sure, Declan. Um, I'll keep you posted on anything there. All right. So we've been going over an hour and I haven't even started on the preloaded 
questions. Big shout out to Paul. Great to have you with us, Paul. Uh, thanks for nipping in there. Um, so in the preloaded questions, uh, we've got Benoit. Who says, now this is going to open up a big kettle of fish or a can of something, can of worms, I believe. What paint would you recommend for repaint, repainting a Hobie 16? Well, on um, most boats like the Hobie 16, the boats are originally coated in gel coat, um, which is a lot harder than paint generally. Um, but as you may have seen from some of the videos earlier on this year on Joyrider TV, um, we've had quite a few of our boats recoated and recoated with what? Well, I'm not entirely sure. Um, when when the boats arrived back from being recoated, they'd been chucked in a truck. So they had arrived damaged. So we had to um, repair the damage to make them look nice. So this is what the guide said to get hold of. So we're first using a primer, which says here it's 2K acrylic, acryl, I suppose that's acrylic, acrylic system. So that is the primer. And then I've got absolutely no idea. Uh, this is all part of being in Greece um, of what it says here. But I dare say that is, yeah, Declan says white paint. There we go. Uh, so white paint generally. But um, I think more research is needed on the topic of what paint to paint your boat with. Uh, when I first picked up um, our tornado, which we have for the school here for Wild Wind, I was told that it had been painted in Ford Escort white. No word of a lie. Alex Seal, is that the name of the paint? Says uh, RJ Fleet. If you know about paint, then um, put it in the comments or the live chat so that we can all learn from your experience. All right, we've got Valentine on board um, who says, what type of gear you can wear for cold weather? For now, I only have a swimsuit, windbreaker, harness, float and vest. Yeah, so depending on how cold, um, in the places that I sail, it never gets brutally cold like I know it does for a lot of you. So for me, I just wear a full length wetsuit. In fact, I did do a video called What to Wear, uh, which was a while, a few years ago now. But if you look at, if you put in a search, Hobie Cat, what to wear, or Hobie Cat, which wetsuit, then that What to Wear video will come up. And um, so I'll wear a full length wetsuit for the winter, which would be one of uh, wetsuits are graded in thickness. So the bigger the numbers, the thicker they are and the warmer they will be. So a typical summer wetsuit would be called something like a 3-2. Um, that would be the summer somewhere that's not tropical. And then some like when I used to go to Cape Town, very warm on um, the land, but freezing cold in the water. I used to wear a 4-3. So that's a pretty warm wetsuit. Now, with wetsuits, there is definitely a lot of the more you spend on the wetsuit, the warmer it is going to be. In fact, the last wetsuit that I bought, I would have bought a 4-3, but I thought, no, I'm going to buy a higher quality wetsuit, but thinner. Because a thinner wetsuit is going to be more flexible and it's not going to hinder your movement quite as much. And then for really cold conditions, the general standard would be a 5-4. And the way that these numbers work is that will mean it's got five millimetres of neoprene rubber. That's the stuff that keeps you warm over your vital organs, so over your torso and up to perhaps just above the knee, it would be five millimetres. And then for the extremities like your arms and your lower legs, then it would be four millimetres. And that's the same for all of these 
which allow you a bit more freedom of movement. So that would be the first um, plan of attack is the full length wetsuit. The second plan of attack, which we talked about already today, is the dry suit. A uh, dry suit is like a suit you put on. It's got latex seals around the wrists and the neck. Usually they'll have little boots on the end of your legs. So um, whatever you put on underneath your dry suit will stay completely dry. So you can wear like a fleece suit underneath. And that is definitely the warmest option. There we go. OK, so Lee says, I thought you had said that you were going to be leaving Joyrider. I hope I'm mistaken. Yes, you are mistaken, Lee. Um, I'm actually not leaving Joyrider. I'm leaving Wildwind um, at the end of the season next year. But I'm not leaving the area. I'm still going to be making the videos based from Wildwind. I'm just not going to be working here, which makes it even more important. Uh, that I'm getting this support from you guys because um, it's from that support which is making it possible for me to make the videos and the private coaching my main job rather than the uh, the the day job at Wildwind where the hours were getting ridiculous. On a short day, it was 12 hours a day um, and on a long day, more which is why I decided if I'm going to keep doing the videos as well, I need to focus on one thing and the videos. Now that I've done, I've worked at Wildwind now for 28 years. That's a long time. So um, that's how I've learned everything that I know pretty much. I had done a fair bit before I started here, but um, that's how I feel that I can talk to you guys about this stuff. All right. We are coming to the end of the session, by the way. Um, all right, Ryan says, this is on the uh, repainting your boat. I used a Rust-Oleum Marine top coat from Ace Hardware uh, that I was happy with for a restored boat. Kept it on the beach for $30 a quart. Uh, and that was two years ago. And he's still pretty happy with that fix. All right, Leland Lee says, uh, when I got my Hobie 16, the holes were coated in that top paint. It looks ugly and has lots of paint mar brush marks on it. I plan to strip it down and redo the holes. All right. Chris says, Leland, spray is the only way to make a nice finish. Yes, definitely spray. It's, it's got to be sprayed. All right. So uh, Ryan says, time for me to go to work. All right. Nice to have you on board, Ryan. And nice to have everyone else on board. And it sounds like it's time for Joe to move to Texas, says Chris. Thanks very much, Chris. I'm definitely coming at some point because these Texan barbecues really do sound um, amazing. Uh, Frank is nipping in with better sailing in Florida. All right, let's not go down there. Uh, let's not have a fight for who has the best conditions because we all know that Vasiliki will win. Thanks very much for tuning in today, everybody. It's been an absolute um, great session. Don't forget to hit the like button before you leave. And um, thanks to everybody for the super stickers as well and their continued support. I'm uh, hopefully, if the weather is up to it, going to be having for you this Sunday, you're not going to believe it, but episode 129 of, can, can you guess what it's going to be? Yes, that's right. Show us your cat. Um, but uh, that is the way. All right. Um, best, In fact, best question of the day just come in from Lee. Says, is it possible to set up a monthly payment? Um, I do this for another YouTuber who's great quality videos. Yeah, there's two ways of doing monthly donations. Um, one is through Patreon. You'll find at underneath each video on Joyrider TV, there's a link to my Patreon page. And the other uh, way that you can do it, which is a brand new uh, method, is called a channel membership. Again, that will be linked 
in the more recent videos. Um, and uh, that means you don't have to leave uh, YouTube. And with the channel memberships, it comes with the added bonus of as soon as I've uploaded a video, you'll be able to watch it immediately. Whereas everybody else has to wait until it goes um, live effectively uh, at the usual time. So uh, the channel memberships have got a lot going for them. Thanks for your question there, Lee. Nice one. All right. Um, thanks very much. And thanks very much. All right. So thanks very much. All right. I'm going to go now and uh, have that dinner. Thanks very much for dinner. Um, and I'll see you hopefully on Sunday with Show Us Your Cat at the normal time. If not, I will be back next Friday with more of this.